This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. This week, a course called The Conservative Intellectual Tradition in America, taught by the Citadel Military College professor Mallory Factor, with guest lecturer Phyllis Schlafly. Schlafly talks about the roots and development of the modern conservative movement, as well as the role of women's issues in conservative politics. This episode was recorded in 2012. Today's topic is cultural conservatism and the religious right. Our discussion will center on the genesis of the pro-family grassroots movement. Our speaker will share with you never before shared details about the ordinary people that sparked culture shifting events and a movement that led to the rise of the religious right and the nomination of Ronald Reagan. You're going, to, you're going to hear about the role in bringing together people of faith from across denominational and religious lines to fight the Equal Rights Amendment. That fight led to the formation of a voting bloc that remains an unstoppable political force and has become the base of today's Republican Party. But enough about, enough hearing from me. Uh, I'd like to introduce now our guest lecturer, Phyllis Schlafly. She's been called the godmother of the modern conservative movement. She's been a conservative leader since 1964 when she self-published her best-selling book, A Choice, Not an Echo. She's been a leader of the pro-family movement since 1972 when she started her national volunteer lobbying organization, Eagle Forum. In a 10-year battle, Mrs. Schlafly trained and led a grassroots army to victory over radical feminists when, they stopped, when, when she stopped the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. Economist George Gilder wrote in his book, Men in Marriage, and I quote, when the histories of this era are seriously written, Phyllis Schlafly will take her place among a tiny number of leaders who made a decisive and permanent difference she changed the political landscape of her country. Gilder went on to call Mr. Schlafly one of the country's best speakers and debater and its best pamphleteer since Thomas Paine. Phyllis, who is a young 87 years old, still publishes a weekly newsletter and has written or edited more than 20 books on subject as, subjects as varied as family and feminism, the judiciary, nuclear strategy, child care, and phonics, which we use with our children. Phyllis is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Washington University in St. Louis. She worked her way through college by working the night shift, testing 30 and 50 caliber ammunition at a local factory. She's received her master's degree in government from Harvard University, her Juris Doctorate, from Washington University Law School in 1978. She's the mother of six children. She was named Illinois Mother of the Year, and the Ladies' Home Journal named her one of the most important women of the 20th century. It gives me a great deal of pleasure and a great honor to welcome Mrs. Phyllis Schlafly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mallory Factor, for all of those nice words. And uh, thank you, students, for caring to learn about details of American history uh, that may not be in your textbooks. And thanks to the guests who are coming today. I appreciate this opportunity to talk to you about uh, some other sidelights of the issue that other speakers may not have covered. You know, you've had all of these uh, distinguished lecturers who, who have preceded me in these series, and I'm sure you've read all the books that they recommend, Edmund Burke and John Locke and Russell Kirk and Ludwig von Mises and John Adams and Blackstone. And uh, those are the scholars who uh, laid the foundation for what we understand as the conservative movement. 
But today I want to take an example of something really that has nothing to do with the conservative movement, but shows you how technology can do a leap forward uh, that could not be done in every other way. In 1975, uh, the people who were meeting and talking about their gripes against the British crown were all trying to make the king shape up and be a good fellow and recognize their rights. Uh, they, all of their entreaties were addressed to the king. And the idea of not having a king really hadn't occurred to them. When they had their convention in, 19, uh, uh, in uh, 1775, uh, I think their, uh, uh, their petition was called the Olive Branch Petition. They're continuing to make entreaties to the king uh, to give them their uh, Englishman's rights. That was in July of 1775. In January of, 19, of 1776, a little pamphlet was published. It was called Common Sense by Thomas Paine. It was only 46 pages. It wasn't written in the scholarly method of those other writers who wrote at that time. It was written for the guys who went to the coffee shop, the, well, the guys who went to the pub. It was in plain language for plain people. And uh, basically he said, we've got to get rid of the king. And uh, it was published January 10th, 46 pages. And by July the 4th, we had the Declaration of Independence. It's one of the most amazing literary accomplishments in literature. And it probably is the best-selling book in history, considering the population that we had in, in, at that time. Uh, it, it, had, it, it, it gripped people. It created the movement for independence. It was something like, uh, it was a different technology. It was something like moving from the horse and buggy to the automobile, or from the typewriter to the internet. That's what the pamphleteer did. Uh, he made it the pamphlet of the new technology, the language of ordinary people. He didn't, didn't have his piece decorated with uh, Latin phrases. It was, it was just direct political language that anybody could understand. Now let's fast forward to uh, the 1930s, the time of the Great Depression, high unemployment, even worse than today. Uh, but even then, Americans were not looking to government to solve their problems. Uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who was uh, expected to be and was elected president in 1932, supposedly to uh, end the Depression, ran on the Democratic platform. And let me tell you what that 1932 Democratic platform said. We advocate an immediate and drastic reduction of government expenditures by abolishing useless commissions and offices, consolidating departments and bureaus, and eliminating extravagance to accomplish a saving of not less than 25% in the cost of the federal government. We favor a federal budget annually balanced. Well, that sounds like the Tea Party, doesn't it? It certainly doesn't sound like the New Deal, uh, which uh, Professor Folsom, I think, explained to you in a previous lecture. FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, knew that the American, that was what the American people wanted to hear. However, once he was elected, he embarked on a big spending program, expanded bureaucracy, use of the Commerce Clause to do all kinds of things that uh, we thought then and now think are unconstitutional. The same arguments that are used in the uh, Obamacare case uh, that was argued before the Supreme Court last week. By the time uh, FDR ran for his third term, uh, prominent Democrats had uh, left him. Uh, the American people really hated FDR, uh, very much like the uh, significant number of people who really uh, hate Obama today. Nevertheless, they elected him four times. And that does not mean the people approved of his uh, spending programs and what he was doing. He certainly did not solve the unemployment problem. Uh, as uh, Professor Folsom has explained to you, he spent the money in states 
where they would get him votes to be reelected. But uh, they um, uh, 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 continued um, to, to do the spending and continued to be reelected. And then another thing happened, uh, which uh, brought a very little book to the fore. It was written by an Austrian named uh, Frederick Hayek, uh, who had become a British citizen. And it's a very short book in which he directly attacked uh, collectivism, the planned economy, and the whole idea that central planning was the way to run an economy. <clears throat> and he took the position that in order to preserve liberty, uh, we had to make a choice. Do we want the government to plan everything, or do we want to have the rule of law? It sounds like Ron Paul, really, the way it was written. But in any event, the initial printing was only 2,000 books. And then something happened to bring it to the grassroots. And that was that the Reader's Digest reprinted it. Now, it's hard to remember to, or th believe today, but the Reader's Digest then had five million subscribers, and everybody read the Reader's Digest in those years. And uh, so this reached the, the plain people, the uh, grassroots, and they believed it, and it had a, a tremendous impact on our country in explaining what was wrong with the New Deal and how we did, want, uh, did not want to go uh, to uh, central planning of our economy. Now, I happened to be at uh, the Harvard Graduate School that year. And uh, don't let anybody tell you that opportunities for education for women only started when the feminists came along, because uh, I was getting my degree at the Harvard Graduate School in 1945, long before all these feminists were born. And <coughs> competed with all the guys, had no problem. And uh, Hayek came there to speak on his cross-country tour. And um, I remember how the professors gathered us to explain to us how we were not supposed to believe what Hayek was saying. They were preparing us for his coming and how to refute him and to answer him. And uh, they were all New Dealers, my professors at Harvard then. I remember one whose favorite saying was, uh, we shouldn't talk about balancing the budget. We should talk about budgeting the balance. And then we had another one who, uh, who devoted one whole lecture in his constitutional law class to telling us that Henry Wallace was the greatest political thinker of the 20th century. Now, if you studied your history, you know he was the closest thing to a communist we ever had anywhere near the White House. And uh, he was so uh, way out left wing that uh, he was too bad even for Roosevelt, who dumped him as vice president uh, when he ran for his fourth term in 1944 and replaced him with Harry Truman. But in any event, the conventional wisdom in America then was that the planned economy was the wave of the future and the way to go. And um, the, uh, was, there was a lot of opposition that was building to uh, Roosevelt. Um, there were a number of organizations f uh, organized by the grassroots to oppose him. Uh, there are only two that I know that have survived till this day. One is the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, which is the uh, conservative uh, doctors, and they filed three briefs in this Obamacare case, but they started in the mid-1940s. And the other is America's Future, uh, which still publishes a newspaper and still is around, uh, but most of the others died out. And. Um, so what was the kind of opposition, political opposition, to all this? Well, uh, you look to the Republican Party. Now, the Republican Party in those years was pretty well run by what we call the Kingmakers. And they were headquartered in New York, and particularly in the Chase Manhattan Bank. And they thought uh, uh, they were divinely appointed to select the Republican nominee, uh, which wouldn't who would not very much challenge what Roosevelt was doing. In 1940, 
they forced on the Republicans a man named Wendell Wilkie, who wasn't even a Republican. He had been a Democrat. And uh, he was kind of a 90-day wonder. Uh, they enlisted all the w media. Uh, they did a lot of crooked things, and they put him over as the nominee. And he ran for president on the Republican ticket and lost to Roosevelt. And then in 1944, uh, they tried a, Republic a, uh, a governor, former governor of New York named Tom Dewey, uh, the one whom uh, I th uh, somebody called uh, looking like the, the little man on the wedding cake. And uh, uh, he didn't do very well in 44. And then came 1948, and they had the gall to nominate Tom Dewey again, which uh, we, the grassroots, were very much opposed to. Uh, but they forced him on us. And uh, uh, there was a lot of opposition to the grassroots. I remember Alice Roosevelt Longworth said, you can't make a souffle rise twice. But at any rate, uh, uh, Tom Dewey was the candidate, and uh, there were all kinds of wonderful issues that he could have talked about. The Truman scandals, the Korean War, the communist infiltration of our government, the Alger Hiss case. But Tom Dewey waged a Me Too campaign, and he lost, and Roosevelt was elected for his uh, fourth term. Then came 1946, the off-year election. And this, by this time, the grassroots were really getting angry about the whole thing. And they went out and uh, carried on a campaign under the slogan, Had Enough. And they elected what was the biggest Republican majority in Congress uh, uh, in um, the 20th century. So as we approach the uh, approached the Republican Convention of 1952, everybody expected a Republican year. And the con contestants uh, were uh, Bob Taft, Senator Bob Taft, who had the support of the grassroots and was, I think, the first authentic conservative, as we understand it in the uh, modern terminology. However, I can tell you, in those days, Nobody called themselves conservatives. It was not a word that we used. He was just a run-of-the-mill, garden-variety Republican. And the Kingmakers put up Eisenhower, who was a military hero, whom they had installed as a university president to keep him safe until the time of the convention so that he wouldn't have to take any uh, stands on controversial issues. But the grassroots wanted uh, Bob Taft because he spoke up for uh, typical American values, foreign and domestic. And uh, he had uh, uh, his book, A Foreign Policy for Americans, another short book, which uh, we liked and we distributed. And he was the guy uh, we hoped to uh, nominate in 1952. Uh, well, if, um, if you read about it, you can find that it was another one of these crooked conventions and uh, the, they succeeded in, uh, in nominating Eisenhower uh, after they went to the governor of California, who was then Earl Warren, and promised him the next vacancy on the Supreme Court if he would deliver the big California delegation for the vote on the Credentials Committee and the vote on the Rules Committee, both of which they had changed. And he did. And, uh, uh, I, the Eisenhower was not part of the deal, but he was persuaded to fulfill uh, that uh, commitment that his handlers had made. And uh, it was a terrible, terrible mistake because the Eisenhower court uh, was really the beginning of all of these bad decisions we began to discuss uh, later and find out what was happening. In fact, later on, Eisenhower was asked one day, did you make any mistakes while you were president? And he said, yes, two, and they're both sitting on the Supreme Court. <laughs> <coughs> uh, but um, anyway, um, I, we, Eisenhower was nominated, and we all supported him, and he won. Uh, but after that, we began to realize the enormity of the communist threat both the Soviet missile threat and the infiltration of our government by communist spies and people who were spreading our secret information 
to the Soviet Union. There was also infiltration in the universities uh, and in Hollywood. And we had investigations of communism by the various uh, congressional committees uh, and uh, reports that were widely read by the American people. In those days, everybody could read. And it's not like today where we have all this uh, widespread illiteracy in our country. But everybody could read, and they did read the congressional reports. And uh, they uh, understood what communism was and um, why we wanted to uh, get rid of the infiltration in our government. Because the grassroots took up the study of communism from the congressional reports. Now, in 1956, there's one man, again, you, you talk about what one person can do, but one man named Fred Swartz had an enormous impact in building the conservative movement. He was an Australian physician who was invited one day to, be, to debate a communist, and he beat him, and then he realized how evil communism really is. And he realized that the United States was the main battleground. So he came to this country, and he worked in this country for 50 years. He had an enormous impact in building the start of the conservative movement. He brought thousands of people into what we didn't call the conservatives. Again, we're not using the term conservative, but it was the anti-communist movement, so that we had a grassroots that was well and well informed. And I got him to put on his first um, school. He conducted these five-day schools, nine to five, all on communism. He'd have a couple of other speakers, gave uh, several of the speakers' speeches himself, uh, but he had other distinguished speakers on the subject. And I assisted him in putting on the first one in 1956 at the Tower Grove Baptist Church in St. Louis. And he realized what he could do by training people with a five-day class. So he then had them all over the country. And all the time I meet people who came into the conservative movement attending one of the Swartz schools. It, it was such a big thing that when he got to California, he filled the Los Angeles sports arena with 16,000 people for one of his schools. Now, uh, his, um, uh, he... Uh, ultimately has a book that ought to be in your library uh, called You Can Trust the Communists to Be Communists. In other words, the com un unlike some of our enemies today, the communists told us exactly what they were going to do. We are going to bury you. And they told us exactly how they were going to do it. And the reason his book, which probably didn't have a big sale, uh, but the reason it's so readable is it was all his speeches. And a lot of books which start out as speeches are much more readable for the grassroots and ordinary people. And he called his organization the Christian Anti-Communism Crusade. So it had a certain evangelical uh, aspect to it. So at the end of this first school, I said, well, we got to bring the Catholics in too and have them join. No, he said, you can't put the Catholics and the Protestants in the same room. It just isn't going to work. The Catholics will have to have their own organization. So we got the Catholics to start their organization called the Cardinal Manzetti Foundation. And we promoted study groups all over the country. And at one time, I think we had 5,000 of these study groups because it was based on the congressional uh, uh, reports. And I repackaged it for a Repu Republican Federation, uh, for the DAR, and for the Catholic group, which was called the Cardinal Manzani Foundation. So people were learning, learning about government, learning about our enemies, learning about communism all the time. And just to show you <clears throat> what the ordinary Republican in those days, we're talking about the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, thought, uh, I, I looked up some of the resolutions passed by the Illinois Federation of Republican Women, which was just, you know, they're just ordinary uh, w uh, women Republican volunteers who uh, like to be supportive and support their candidates in politics. 
and they had resolutions against the centralization of power in Washington, against UN treaties and UNESCO, against the drive for disarmament. They had resolutions that demanded victory over communism, full support of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. They had a resolution to stop all federal aid to education, wipe it out. They had resolutions which condemned the Supreme Court decisions that were siding with the communists. They had resolutions which condemned the accumulated power in the executive branch and the president, the sprawling bureaucracy, the weakening of constitutional restraints that, that permitted advocates of socialism and communism to make inroads in national security, and further and then, uh, resolutions against the further centralization of power in the federal government. Again, nobody used the word conservative. They were just garden variety Republicans. It sounds like, kind of like Ron Paul today, uh, but nobody called them extremists. That's just the way people thought, especially in the Middle West. And uh, uh, our files have a whole file of letters from congressmen saying, thank you for sending us this resolution. We agree 100% with it. And, and that was the thinking of people in those days. Now, uh, one of the things that they were, we were worried about in those days were bad Supreme Court decisions that were siding with the communists. And even the American Bar Association was on our side in this fight, even the American Bar Association. The American Bar Association had a committee that put out this report on communist tactics, strategy, and objectives which set forth 10 of the worst pro-communist decisions of the Supreme Court. This was put in the congressional record, first by Senator Bridges and then later by Senator Dirksen. And <clears throat> I'll bet millions of copies went out. It became a major vehicle to educate the grassroots about what the court was doing about communism. <clears throat> and in also in those years, uh, one, of the, one of the most popular speakers was Dean Clarence Mannion of the Notre Dame Law School. And he wrote a little book, less than 100 pages, called The Key to Peace, and uh, talked about the re religious foundation of our country and uh, the, the, a lot of the conservative ideas that we have today. Uh, again, we're not using the term conservative, but this is just the way uh, people believed and thought in those uh, years of the, of the late 50s and uh, early 1960s. <clears throat> and then we looked around for a president. And who were going to run for president? And somebody suggested a senator from Arizona. Well, now, nobody from Arizona had ever been elected president before. This guy, uh, Arizona, why, you know, at that, at that time, we didn't have any baseball team that was farther west or south than St. Louis. Nobody went out to Arizona in those days. And coming from, you, could, you had to come from Ohio or Pennsylvania to be pre, or New York to be president. But anyway, <clears throat> we all picked on uh, Barry Goldberg as the guy we wanted. So he had to have a book, too. So he had a book. You gotta run, when you run for president, you have to have a book. And his book, called The Conscience of a Conservative, which soon came out in paperback also, had a big sale. And we all know that actually the book was written by Brent Bozell, who's the father of the guy who runs uh, that media organization today. And, uh, but Dean Mannion, Dean Clarence Mannion, gave it the title. And this is the first time people began to call themselves conservative. After the conscience of a conservative came out, this was kind of proof that conservatives were not heartless people. They really had a conscience. And we began proudly to call ourselves conservatives. <clears throat> and so um, we um, uh, were studying all the time, reading widely, uh, reading the, the books of the ex-communists like uh, uh, Boudin's and uh, Whitaker Chambers and so forth, knowing what it was all about, <clears throat> and uh, beginning to plan for Barry Goldwater. Uh, we made a try for him 
in Chicago in 1960, and that's when we didn't have enough votes, and Barry Goldberg came out on the stage and said, uh, conservatives, this isn't our year. Go home and I'll see you in four years. And so that's what we did, and we distributed his book and did some more studying. And one of the major factors in building the ranks of the conservatives was this paperback called None Dare Call It Treason by John Stormer. It was a little longer than some of these other paperbacks, but it really set forth what had happened to our country and the dangers of communism and the danger of central planning and the dangers of, uh, of uh, an overgrown bureaucracy and high taxation and so forth. He published it himself and he sold seven million copies. And, and that was a major educational tool of the grassroots who are now beginning to come alive. Now, as we approached the 1964 convention of the Republican Party, uh, which was in um, Chicago in 19, 1964, um, I had kind of had a hobby of Republican national conventions, and I had been to all of them beginning in 52. And most of the people who go to Republican conventions as delegates are first-timers. The majority of them have never been before, and they don't know what to expect and, and don't know how it really operates. And I figured they ought to know what went before. So I wrote my little book called A Choice, Not an Echo. And uh, I plunged in getting a printing of 25,000. I thought that would be it. I ended up selling three million out of my garage. And they went to all the people who were delegates who were interested in the next nomination. And um, it had a tremendous impact. Every, every week I meet some public official who says, I came into the conservative movement reading A Choice Not an Echo in 1964. Uh, most uh, political literature just simply revs up your juices for your prejudices, but mine was persuasive. Goldwater's opponent was Nelson Rockefeller, a former New York governor. And uh, my book persuaded Rockefeller people to switch and support Goldwater and persuaded Lyndon Johnson people to switch and support Goldwater. So we had the 1964 convention and we nominated Goldwater. That was the conservatives taking over the Republican Party. And then, as you know, Goldwater went down to a, a smashing defeat for many reasons uh, we don't have time to talk about here. But at any rate, 27 million people voted for uh, uh, Goldwater and they never regretted it. And that was the, really the start of coming together of the conservative movement. Now, conservatives then developed a kind of a complex. Because of this defeat, we kind of thought, well, I guess we can't really elect a real conservative president. And that's why we uh, went for Nixon on the next round. We thought he was the best we could do, which turned out to be a mistake. <coughs> But in, in any event, the conservative movement was there, and the anti-communist movement was there. But that wasn't enough. And then something else happened. Congress voted out a new constitutional amendment supported by the feminists called the Equal Rights Amendment. Everybody was for it. it, it, it the support... Uh, well, there were only 23 people in the House who voted against it. There were only, I think, eight in the Senate who voted against it. Uh, uh, President Nixon, President Ford, and President Carter were all enthusiastic supporters of it. All the governors. Uh, the media was 99% in favor of it. Everybody was for it. Everybody who was anybody in politics, from left to right, from Ted Kennedy to George Wallace, they all endorsed it. And... Um, I was asked to speak about it and made a speech about it, which then turned up in my Phyllis Schlafly report, which I had started a few years before. It's looked exactly the same for 45 years, Phyllis Schlafly report. And I wrote one called, What's Wrong with Equal Rights for Women? And uh, sent it out to my friends. I sold this, the, mag the uh, report by subscription for $5 a year. 
so they're mostly, mostly women I had worked with in the Republican Party. And uh, one day the next month, uh, one of them called up and said, Phyllis, we took your report to the legislature and they voted down the Equal Rights Amendment. And so then I thought we had something. And I invited 100 women from 30 states to uh, meet me in St. Louis. And I put them on a bus and took them down to the riverfront. And we went on one of these showboats. And I climbed up on the stage where they do all these melodramas. And I told them, we're going to go out and beat the Equal Rights Amendment. At that point, nobody thought it was possible. They thought we were crazy because in the first year, the ERAers got 30 states. They only needed 38, three-fourths of the country. So we took it on. And it's, uh, it's a long story. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, we had big fights in state after state. Uh, in Illinois, was the, it was the front line. And Illinois voted on it every year for 10 years. And we kept beating them, and they kept coming back. Uh, five states that had previously voted for it rescinded. And uh, this was not a battleground in every state. But the main battlegrounds were Illinois, Florida, and North Carolina, and uh, a little bit in uh, uh, Missouri and Oklahoma, and then the rescinding states. And uh, we kept beating them. And um, when ERA came, I'll tell you about, and I haven't got time to tell you all the things wrong with it, but uh, they offered this amendment to put women in the Constitution. Well, you've read the Constitution. You know men are not in the Constitution. It's a completely sex-neutral document. It only talks about citizens, persons, electors, presidents, uh, and we the people. It's all completely sex-neutral. Women have had every constitutional right men have since the day it was uh, written. And uh, so that was a fraud. They were not able to offer any benefit to women. I testified in 41 state legislative hearings, and in only one state, did uh, one of their people come in and say, our state has a law that discriminates that ERA will remedy. They had a law that said that wives could not make homemade wine without their husband's consent. So for this, we need a constitutional amendment? You got to be kidding. And but when they went on TV, they, thought, they made women think ERA was going to give them a raise. But ERA would have nothing to do with uh, employment because the employment laws were already sex neutral. And what ERA would do would be to make every law sex neutral. And uh, the classic discriminatory law was the draft law. And we were then in the Vietnam War. We had a draft. And uh, my daughters, I had daughters and sons that age, and they thought it was the craziest thing anybody said. Are you going to give women a uh, constitutional amendment, and the first thing is they have to sign up for the draft like their brothers. You've got to be kidding. It was unsaleable. And, uh, but anyway, it went on. Now, when ERA came out of Congress, they were given a time limit of seven years. And as they were moving along, they realized they might not make it. And so Bella Abzug was then in Congress. You remember, she's the funny woman with the hats. And uh, she got Congress to give her $5 million to have a special uh, convention in Houston, which was supposed to be used to uh, ratify the uh, Equal Rights Amendment. And um, they had their meeting. And it was an enormous media event. There were 3,000 media people who went to Houston to cover this. This, you know, the feminists had so much free press all the time. And uh, they were there and giving them great coverage. Well, uh, the feminists passed their resolution saying they wanted the Equal Rights Amendment. But then that didn't satisfy them. They began to tell the rest of their agenda. They said they wanted abortion funded by the taxpayers. So they had a big thing about that. And for all these resolutions, they're letting off balloons and they're prancing around. And uh, <clears throat> then the next one, was they uh, endorsed the whole list of gay rights. We're talking about 1977 now, 
This was not agreeable to the American people, but they're putting all this on television. They're all prancing around with these victories. Uh, they wanted uh, universal uh, government-supported daycare. You have to understand the feminists. The feminists believe that women are victims of the patriarchy. And it's, it's up to new laws and the Constitution to remedy this second-class citizenship of women. Absolutely false. The American women are the most fortunate class of people who ever lived on the face of the earth. We can do anything we want to do. And, but anyway, that's the line they're putting out. And their prime example of the oppression of women by the patriarchy is that society expects mothers to look after their babies. And that burden has got to be lifted from them by the taxpayers. And we need to have government-run and regulated daycare. So they passed all these resolutions. And they whooped it up and had a big old time. And, and every important, well-known feminist was there doing this. Uh, uh, Betty Friedan was making an impassioned plea to invite the lesbians to come and join them. And um, they um, passed all the resolutions. And I uh, remember, uh, after that was over, uh, somebody asked the Missouri governor one day, uh, are you, governor, are you for the Equal Rights Amendment? Well, he said, do you mean the old ERA or the new ERA? He said, I was for equal pay for equal work. But after they went down to Houston and got tangled up with all those abortionists and lesbians, I can tell you ERA will never pass in Missouri. And of course, he was absolutely right. And after that convention, they never got it. They never won another vote. Uh, ER has probably been voted on 25 times since then in various committees or legislatures or even referenda, and is it never won anywhere else. It, the, their, their own $5 million conference, uh, which they were so proud of, uh, simply destroyed them. And, um, but the fight went on because then they ran to, to Jimmy Carter and got him to give them a three-year extension. And uh, the cartoonists had a field day with this. This was like giving a baseball game three more innings when it, the game was not tied up. And, uh, but they did not get any more states. And uh, they, uh, they didn't get it. And in, um, at the end of the first seven years, which we considered the real end, because that was the constitutional part, and we considered the, the extension illegal, which a court did finally hold that the extension was illegal. And um, so um, we had a victory party in, in 1979, which was the end of the seven years. And we proclaimed victory over. And the, the press was so angry at me, they could hardly stand it. You're not supposed to win. You're not going to win. Uh, the extension is there. And, um, but uh, it was important for all of these conservatives uh, left over from the uh, Goldwater campaign to realize that it was possible to win. Now, the significant thing that happened in this ERA fight, when I started out, I was holding my finger in the dike with a handful of my Republican women friends. And we'd go to the state legislature, and we were being successful. And then I realized, uh, about 1976, uh, uh, that we were going to need more uh, help. And so that's when I decided, where, where am I going to get more help? So that's when I went to the churches. And please come and join us. And uh, I prayed that we could bring a 1,000 people to Springfield, Illinois, for a demonstration. And uh, that was the day on, uh, I think it was April 26, 1976, that a 1,000 people did come to Springfield, Illinois. And our legislature had never seen anything like this before. And they came and showed them that we were opposed to ERA. So that is the day we invented the pro-family movement. Now, 
in, in building my organization of, uh, first of all, Stop ERA, and then it morphing into Eagle Forum, uh, I was very ecumenical. Uh, I didn't let him talk about religion. Uh, we, I combined the Catholics, the Protestants of all the denominations, the Evangelicals, uh, the Jews, uh, the Mormons, I had them all in there. And the message is, I don't care what your church is, we're all going to work together to beat the Equal Rights Amendment. And I made them all get along. And this was, the, this was the first time, I can tell you, this was the first time a lot of Catholics and Baptists were in the same room together. <laughs> <coughs> and they just had to get along. That's, uh, that's just my policy. And so it was quite a coalition that we had. And uh, when they all came together, uh, at this uh, thousand person demonstration at the Capitol, it was a visual demonstration of the pro family movement. And then uh, we swell, really swelled our ranks when the Baptists joined us. And that's when Jerry Falwell started his moral majority. And when he came to another demonstration, we actually had 10,000 people at another demonstration at the Springfield Capitol. So this is the building of the pro family movement and realizing that people of faith and people who had similar values uh, could work together for a goal they shared. Now, initially, uh, the uh, Roe v. Wade and abortion was not playing that role because when Roe v. Wade was handed down by the court in 1973, uh, the Catholic bishops jumped in to fight it. Well. The Protestants were not going to join up with something the Catholic bishops were running. So they hung back. And it was several years before the Protestants came in. Of course, they did finally, and they've now taken, kind of taken over the movement, and that's just fine. Everybody's working together fine uh, against uh, abortion. But it was in um, about uh, 1976 that we realized that one of the reasons the feminists wanted ERA was they felt it was the key to locking abortion funding into the Constitution. The Supreme Court had handed down a decision, the Harris v. Roe decision, which said you did not have a constitutional right to have your abortion paid for. But they wanted it paid for, and they thought they could get that through ERA because they would charge that it was sex discriminatory to deny this money. And of course, they've made that case in a number of courts, and they've made it elsewhere too. Uh, but that showed that if you were for ERA, you were also abor for abortion. And so they joined ranked with, ranked with us uh, finally. And uh, that tended to continue to build the pro-family movement. And eventually, it took on other issues also. But that was the start when we put it together. Now, when they had their big shindig in Houston in 1977, financed by the taxpayers, we took another hall across town in Houston and invited people to come at their own expense and to attend our pro-family rally. And uh, we packed. Uh, 20,000 people into a hall that was only supposed to hold 18,000. And they all came at their own expense. And uh, I think that's the day pro-family movement went into the political vocabulary, because that's what we called ourselves. And that would have been in uh, uh, 1976. So um, the fight went on. Uh, but eventually, they didn't get any more states after that Houston uh, convention, and we won, and they haven't gotten over it yet. They're still fighting about it. But it's a, it's a ridiculous proposal, and uh, it, it is really kind of an inspiring tale that a, a little group of grassrooters could take on the entire establishment and, and beat them. And, and I want to tell you, we just had everybody against us. We had, gov we had governors who marched against us in the picket line. We had every, the, the media was hammering us constantly. And uh, yet, we, we were able to make our case, uh, stick, on, stick to the facts, argue how ERA was going to hurt women, and uh, we were ultimately uh, successful. Uh, we were nice to the legislators. 
the, uh, e the feminists would, uh, they would really talk nasty to them. In fact, as the, as the last few days in Illinois, they did things like having a chain gang chain themselves to the door of our Senate chamber. So the tenders had to step over them to get into their seats. And then one day they went to the slaughterhouse and got plastic vials of pig's blood and came back and wrote on our marble floors the names of the people they hated the most. They didn't understand that didn't get them any more votes. <laughs> Meanwhile, we were doing things like sending the, the legislators valentines and, <laughs> and br bringing them home-baked bread and, and, and being nice to them. And uh, ultimately, ultimately, we won. But uh, that, was the, that was the start of uh, what we now call the pro-family the pro movement that has played such a big part. Now, after we pro proclaimed victory in, uh, in 1978, uh, uh, then you see the next big thing coming up was the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. And uh, uh, it was, a lot of us were not sure we could win. You know, we didn't have a vision of victory in the conservative movement those days. We were working for him. You know, conservative mindset in those days, we're going to pass out our literature and do our thing, but we're probably not going to win. But anyway, uh, what Reagan did was there were not enough people left over from the Goldwater voters to elect a president, but he successfully and skillfully combined the fiscal conservatives left over from the Goldwater campaign, the people who'd been brought in to the anti-communist movement who cared about national defense, and the people who've been brought into the pro-family movement through Stop ERA and the Fight for Life. And uh, he won a great victory in 80 and 84. And uh, so you need those three legs in order to win. You, can't, you really can't win with one of them. But uh, Reagan proved that that is the, the key to success, and uh, that's what they did. And uh, uh, it was, um, the ERA fight was a fight well worth making. It's, it's an inspiring tale of how grassrooters can really take over and beat the whole establishment. And uh, we've now since then been in um, many other issues. Uh, the successful candidates are people who can combine uh, the, the different legs. You all don't, all the voters don't have to agree on everything, but if they can all agree on their candidate, that's great. And each one of those groups saw in Ronald Reagan a way of achieving their goal. And that's, uh, that is why he won. And uh, when uh, candidates now say we're going to put the, the social issues or the moral issues in the deep freeze or the back burner, they're making a terrible mistake because they're kicking away large blocks of voters who are important to their victory. And so I feel that the uh, pro-family movement has played a tremendous role. And uh, there are so many people who came into the Republican Party uh, through these social and moral issues. And uh, it's uh, uh, just... Uh, is there so many other issues they care about? We got into the issue of marriage, which is another social issue. And uh, I'm sure that this part of the conservative movement was very influential in passing about 30 constitutional amendments in support of traditional marriage and passing the DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, by Congress. Wonderful law that uh, Obama is not enforcing. You know, one of the principal duties of the president is to see that the laws are faithfully executed. He's not faithfully executing DOMA. In fact, he's got his uh, attorney general trying to beat it through uh, getting some uh, supremacist judge to throw it out. And uh, that's just one of many ways he's been violating the Constitution. But the, the people who care about the moral issues are extremely important to the conservative constituency. And uh, they have to be kept part of it. Uh, human motivation is, is very uh, complex. And it's the decline in marriage, marriage rates, that is the chief reason for the enormous amount of welfare and the enormous numbers of people who are being supported at taxpayer expense. 
We've now got 47% of the American people who are existing in whole or in part on government. And uh, we don't want to build a nation of dependent people. We want, a, we want a nation of people who can make their own way. I mean, I grew up during the Great Depression. We didn't look to government. Government wasn't any help at all. And now we've got uh, more than 40 programs which funnel uh, cash or benefits uh, to people who are not married, mostly. They say it's for the children. Well, it's encouraging women to have children without getting married. It's a terrible mistake. They're going to be poor. You ought to tell them you're going to be poor all your life if you do that. But they're existing by the government. And uh, so uh, there are all of these social and moral issues that are so important. The, the welfare part of our budget is the fastest growing and the biggest part. There, it's, it's now even more money than we're spending on national defense. And um, Obama knows that. That's why they're trying to increase the number of single moms, because they all, they all vote for Obama, or most of them do, because that's where they're getting their support. So there are many of these social issues that are absolutely vital, and uh, it is necessary that we have uh, that part of the constituency to vote for a president. So uh, do we have time to take a few questions? We'll, we're going to be right back with some questions. We'll be, we'll be back with we're questions. Set, and we'll be back with questions. Oh, OK. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. We will be right back with some questions and answers, and I'm sure we have a lot of questions to ask. Okay, we're back here with Ms. Phyllis Schlafly, and we're going to have a little bit of a discussion and take some questions and answers. Ms. Schlafly, I'm told that really the conservative movement began in the 1820s with the Sunday mail crisis. That was the birth of the religious right. Are you, are you, um, I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, do you, do you think that that has any significance to it? Uh, well, um, in, the, in the 18th and 19th century, uh, religion was more prominent in uh, public discourse than it was later. And so I don't know if that was specifically a religious movement or it was just their normal way of talking. Uh, but that was a fight over whether they would deliver mail on Sunday. That's right, and it, it happened actually twice. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if you can trace that through to the conservative movement that, uh, that Barry Goldwater, and uh, I, I don't know if you can really trace it through to that. But I thought we were really talking about what might be called the modern conservative movement. But as I pointed out, the... The American people were, were conservative, period. They didn't think of themselves as conservatives, but they were pretty conservative. I mean, you, uh, I read you the Democratic platform of 1932 and, and earlier mm -hmm. things that are just uh, sound like Ron Paul. Now, now, you really were out there fighting against the feminist movement. Yes. And you beat ERA. Yes. But aren't we all feminists today? Oh, no, no. <laughs> Let me tell you, when, when, when I started out as a working girl after I, after I got out of Harvard, I worked for a man whose ambition in life was to reclaim the word liberal. Mm -hmm. You know, liberal used to mean somebody was for liberty. And then the, the, the left-wingers took it over, and uh, liberal meant spending more money and more government and so forth. And he wanted to reclaim it. It's a hopeless task. We, it's just hopeless task. A liberal is a pejorative now. Since Michael Dukakis, we, we, it's, it's a bad word. No politician wants to be called a liberal anymore. And I think that's the way we should treat feminism. Uh, the people, the American, all polls show the American women do not want to be called feminists. And uh, it's, it's not a good word. It's, it's a bad word. And, and everything they stand for is bad and destructive. And it starts from the point of trying to paint American women as victims. And that is just nonsense. American women are the most fortunate people who ever lived on this earth. Let's take a question from our cadets. 
Um, Cadet Mellon. Uh, you were talking earlier about uh, the Republican Party before the entrance of the uh, pro-family movement, and you said that the garden variety Republican had very uh, libertarian views. So what role did the pro-family uh, movement have in kind of overriding that libertarian view within the Republican Party? And what implications does that have for the future of the Republican Party? Oh, well, I think the, the pro-family people came into the party um, with the Stop ERA movement and the pro-life movement. And it's not that, that the Republican Party was uh, anti-life or, or anti-family before that. They just didn't, didn't talk about it. They were talking about balancing the budget and, and cutting back on spending and so forth. And uh, so um, I think the, the pro-family movement um, it, it played a role on its own, and it was extremely helpful. And the first place it showed itself was in defeating the Equal Rights Amendment, and then the second place in electing Ronald Reagan. But I, I don't think anybody felt it was contrary to what came before. It just was an addition. Did, what, do you, what explains specifically um, the religious interest in politics? Why is there religious interest in politics? Well, at the present time, I think there is an organized, systematic attack on religion by the ACLU, uh, other organizations like Americans United for Separation of Church and State, who want to uh, eliminate any mention of religion in general and Christianity in particular from any part of our public life. And uh, in other words, I say they want to treat them like smokers. You can do it in your own room, but you can't do it in public. And if you read history, you know that uh, uh, in, in the early part of our country, uh, religion and references to God and prayer was all just part of public life. The, in, in no way did the First Amendment uh, mean it could uh, uh, stop uh, opening the legislature with a prayer like some supremacist judge did in Indiana. Said the Indiana legislature couldn't open with a prayer that mentioned Jesus, but it was okay if they mentioned Allah. If, no. if, if we go back to one of our earlier lectures, we talked about de Tocqueville, and he seemed to think nothing less than a religious society could sustain a Republican form of government. So, so please, please think about that. Uh, our next question, uh, Cadet Selmaska. Uh, Ms. Schlafly, the Article 4 of the Constitution talks about, um, you know, full faith and credit of other states and the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Um, so, you know, if I have a driver's license in Pennsylvania, I can drive in South Carolina and, and be okay. They'll respect that. Well, my question is, doesn't the Defense of Marriage Act kind of interfere with with that part of the Constitution and that other states aren't obligated to recognize certain marriages in Massachusetts or Iowa? Uh, well, I think the, the language of DOMA did allow for that, and I think the language of the Constitution allows for exceptions. But in any event, when uh, one of our candidates said, well, we have our laws in uh, Texas, but what New York do, does is their own business, that won't do at all because you can't be married in Massachusetts or in New York and not in Texas because people travel. And uh, uh, that essentially was a mistaken decision in the Dred Scott case. Some states recognized the slave as property and other states didn't. And the guy who owned the Dred Scott traveled into a free state. Well, does that mean he's free? And the Supreme Court came down wrong on that. But you, you, in our country, you can't be married in one state and then not be married when you move to Texas. And so we've got to, I think we have to have a national rule about uh, marriage, and DOMA is a very good rule. It, it takes care of the faith, full faith and credit provision of the Constitution, 
and it takes care of respecting traditional marriage. There's a notion of ecumenism of the trenches and um, among conservatives, and it includes Protestants, Catholics, Jews. How can there be a consensus in light of the profound differences between these groups? Um, how, what unites them? Well, we united them on being against ERA, for one thing. But, but if you look at the, uh, when our country started, um, most of the states had established churches, and they fought hard to defend their uh, established church. But basically, the moral code was the same in all of them. I mean, people had beliefs in marriage that were the same, beliefs in honesty and fulfilling your contracts and other aspects of... Uh, uh, so uh, I think that's what you have to have. You don't, you don't really have to have uh, the same religion, but you need to have the same moral code. Uh, you, you can't be like, uh, as they have proclaimed in, in these Muslims who've been convicted, uh, well, I just lied. The Koran tells me I can lie to achieve our goal. Well, that's not our view. And that's what, you know, the Times Square, the Times Square bomber who tried to blow up um, thousands of people in Times Square. And he was an educated uh, man with a good job, and, but he wasn't really skilled in, in making a bomb. So the bomb didn't go off, which was fortunate. But at any rate, he was tried and convicted. He pled guilty. He said, I'm guilty under your law, but I'm not guilty under my law. But he was a naturalized citizen. And the judge said, well, when you were in, became a naturalized citizen, you swore to uphold uh, the Constitution. He said, I lied. You're my enemy. Well, that's not our moral code, whatever your religion is. Uh, Cadet Faust. Um, earlier you said that putting away social and moral issues was a mistake. But do we, and you, it's come up several times, but do we really want the federal government regulating moral and social issues, because that's all well and good until they disagree with you. Um, for, and even among Christi different Christian sects, there's different beliefs and, I mean, for instance, let's go with the Episcopalians are allowing homosexual leadership within their church. Why don't we leave religion to the churches rather than having the government regulate it? And like Christianity, if that's what you believe, when it's up and went on its own. Well, you can leave religion, but you can't leave marriage for the reasons that I just said. You can't be married in, in New York and not married in Texas. That, that just is an impossible situation. And uh, so we don't believe in that. I, uh, you've got the libertarians who think that you shouldn't have any laws about marriage. It should be a private matter. That's, I think that is absolutely wrong. Uh, we need laws. If a man marries a child, he ought to be arrested, prosecuted, and put in jail. Uh, you need a law for that. If a man marries a, a couple of women, he ought to be put in jail. Uh, uh, I, I, marriage is, is really a, a public event. It's not a private event. You have to have witnesses for a marriage. And uh, the uh, community uh, should, as got to set the, set the standards for it. And, and we need to have laws to punish those who disobey them. Um, Mr. Lacey. This kind of follows up on that. Um, you briefly just mentioned uh, polygamy. Um, and I'd say in different religions or cultures, and one could perhaps say you know, the church of secularism might consider gay marriage uh, one way or certain religions might believe in polygamy or such. What, how would you actually define the sanctity of marriage? Is that purely something Judeo-Christianity has a monopoly on? Or if some of these other cultures may have a different idea of what the sanctity of marriage is? Well, DOMA does that very well. The DOMA law is an excellent law. It defines marriage as a union of a man and a woman. No problem. It's a well-written law. It was overwhelmingly passed by Congress, signed by Bill Clinton. And uh, it's, it's not tied to Christianity. It's tied to our essential uh, moral values in this country. And polygamy 
has been against the law in this country since the middle of the 19th century. In fact, the very first Republican platform, which was adopted in 1856, said we, we, con we condemn the twin, um, I think it's the, the, the twin evidences of barbarism, polygamy and slavery. And uh, you couldn't uh, become a state in the Union unless you had laws against polygamy. I, I think it's absolutely wrong to ad admit immigrants who have polygamous wives. It's, it has been against our, law, our laws that long, and those laws should be obeyed. I'd like to step back for a few moments and discuss Roe Ro v. Wade and the emergence of the re religious right. A lot, some people talk about Roe v. Wade as, as causing um, the religious right to coalesce, but if we look back in 1973, for instance, the Southern Baptist Convention endorsed Roe v. Wade. Almost every Protestant group or uh, denomination endorsed the decision. Do, do you think that had a major impact on, on putting together this cultural um, conservative community? I think Roe well, v. Wade I think, as I said, that the Catholic bishops jumped in to denounce it right away. And um, uh, the Baptists weren't going to join up with the Catholic bishops, no matter what they said. And, and uh, eventually, they realized that uh, the, 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 the babies being aborted were really babies. And they, they came in uh, to the movement. Um, but I, I think... Uh, um, what else are you? Uh, well, I, was, I, I wanted to. I want to get a feel for if, if you think that it's Roe v. Wade that really was got a lot of people to coalesce. And I guess from your earlier. Uh, well, uh, they didn't coalesce in 1973, but they did by 1976. They did come together. But in, in, in 1962 and, and in 48 as well, there was a major school prayer controversy, and there was a Supreme Court decision. Engel versus Vitale. Some mm -hmm. people said that was a coalescing um, movement, or that was, that was something to coalesce, the movement coalesced around that decision. Do you think that was a, a major part of the conservative movement coalescing? Well, it was widely denounced by all kinds of people when they took prayer out of the schools. Mm -hmm. But, um, and as we look back, it was the beginning of a long series of uh, decisions that are anti-religion, but uh, uh, it, it was the, the, the anti-prayer decisions were uh, condemned by all kinds of people, but they didn't really coalesce and get ready to fight it. They didn't realize how bad the Supreme Court was going to be. Did I bring a copy of my book, The Supremacist, to, yeah. to show? Um, in talking about uh, writing for plain people, there are a lot of fine books on the court, but hold it up. Well, but well, my book, The Supremacist, is, is really written for non-lawyers. What? It's in the other room. Okay, it was taken to the other room. It was taken to the other room. Well, anyway, it's called The, the Supremacist, The Tyranny of Judges and, and How to Stop It. And um, that was the start of a long series of anti-religion decisions. And they've gotten so extreme now, um, the valedictorian can't uh, uh, thank God for success in her studies. They even have one that uh, uh, the football coach can't bow his head when the team says a prayer before a game. It's the ridiculous decisions like this. There's nothing in the First Amendment that uh, requires that. and. Uh, now you've been you've been critical of Jimmy Carter uh, during your talk and, and, and at other mm -hmm. times, but wasn't Jimmy Carter the first evangelical president? I mean, was it was wasn't 1976 almost a watershed moment for uh, the cultural conservative movement with both Jimmy Carter and Chuck Colson? Well, Jimmy Carter did rally the evangelicals. He said he was an evangelical, and he. He rallied that constituency to support him, and they did elect him. And then once he was elected, he betrayed him. He appointed all these judges who ruled against him. 
so so you so it, it, you don't consider that a watershed moment with with his election well he, he did he did get a lot of evangelicals interested in politics yes that's true 76 what was that 76 76 well yeah well that's about the time I was bringing some of them into the Stop ERA movement, just about the same year. Mm -hmm. We'll take some more questions from our cadets. Um, Mr. Ford. Good afternoon, Ms. Shafley. At the end of the 19th century, there was another large Christian movement <clears throat> uh, with good intentions, of course, to help out the impoverished. Um, now you can see that that, that that movement with good intentions has led to the current welfare system that we're in. Do you have any fears that some of the uh, pro-life movements that we have right now could, in another hundred years, turn into a very authorita uh, authoritarian state as far as telling people what they can do inside their house all by themselves and really pushing the uh, uh, religion onto the individual within the household? No, I think Obamacare is a bigger danger of telling people what to do and what they can do in their own house. I don't see... Um, the pro-life movement is doing that. All they want to do is uh, save unborn babies. And I think this one of these most recent laws is one of the best laws of all. They have to show uh, the ultrasound to the woman before she has an abortion. That's just a matter of telling her what's going on. And uh, I, I don't see the pro-lifers as doing anything except want us to save babies. I meant to say pro -family. State programs? So just the pro-family movement, uh, um, the Defense of Marriage Act, uh, a lot of the socially, the Christian right movement right now, that that could eventually turn into an authoritarian state. Turn into? An authoritarian state. Sorry. No, not a chance. Not a chance. Could you give us some insight of how the moral majority came about? You, you were, well, I you think were there. Well, yeah, uh, Jerry Falwell started that in uh, Lynchburg, Virginia, and uh, I think he just wanted to, to join the Stop ERA movement. That's because, why because he started you, Because he, he, he had talked about you being one of the keys yeah. for his starting it. Uh -huh. I mean, how did he do it? What, what, what acts, I mean, how did he, did he call you up? Did, did you talk with him? I did talk with him, yes, a number of times, and he even invited me to speak in his church said I would be the, he didn't believe in ordaining women, but he might ordain me. <laughs> <laughs> if he was going to ordain a woman, he'd ordain me. <laughs> uh, some more questions? Yes, Cadet Selmaska. Um, Ms. Schlafly, gay marriage is seen as <clears throat> such a um, real <clears throat> dangerous threat in our society that we need constitutional amendments to ban it. Um, yet at the same time, nobody's really, you don't really see anyone proposing similar legislation or amendments to ban or outlaw divorce, which I think has proved a more existential threat to, to marriage and the American family. Um, is there an inherent inconsistency there? Well, I, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, Ronald Reagan said signing the uh, easy divorce a law in California which started that trend was the worst mistake he ever made. And uh, if you've read Michael Reagan's book about uh, how he used to sit on the curb of the sidewalk and wait for Saturday for his father to come, it's a, kind of a poignant part of the book. And, uh, but uh, Reagan knew that was a mistake. Uh, and, of course, uh, it swept across the country after that with all the, country, with all the states uh, adopting some easy divorce laws. And, um, uh, yeah, that is a bigger threat. And I, and I think it's also probably a bigger threat than the gay marriage, the way the federal tax laws and spending laws are subsidizing non-marriage. And I've written rather extensively on that on my website, eagleforum.org. You can look up a lot of my columns. But the amount of money that uh, our federal, federal taxpayers' money that's being put, uh, put out to subsidize single moms and uh, 
the welfare system that says, well, we'll keep the goodies flowing as long as you don't get married and don't get a job and don't save any money uh, is just a disaster. What the welfare system did under Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty uh, was, uh, was to channel all the money to the woman, which completely made the father irrelevant. I mean, I grew up in a world where husbands and fathers supported their family, and that was the expected norm. But the, the Lyndon Johnson welfare system, the money all went to the woman, and the father didn't matter. He wasn't needed. And that's extremely unfortunate, and it's gotten worse. There are now 70 uh, programs of cash or benefits that are paid um, majority to single moms. And if they get married, they may lose them. And that means the children will be living in poverty. Who was most helpful to you during your organizing days? Who were the people that were most helpful to you? Well, I had, I had been active in the Illinois, I was president for years uh, of the Illinois Federation of Republican Women. And then I was active in the National Federation of Republican Women. And uh, my Republican women friends were the ones who helped me. It wasn't the Bill Buckleys and the... No, National Review, in 10 years, National Review never had a single article about the Equal Rights Amendment. Just think about that. I had no help from the conservative movement. In 10 years, National Review never had a single article about the Equal Rights Amendment. They were no help at all. I think human events had one. There were, uh, I think, two newspapers that had one friendly editorial. One was in St. Louis and one was Tampa, Florida. So even the, con so even the, con the name conservatives at that time weren't really helping you organize no. that cultural conservative movement? No, they didn't help me at all. Interesting. So yeah. it, it was, what I did was not an outgrowth of, of uh, conservative movement or the Re Republican Party. Well, the, the Republican presidents had all signed on to ERA, Ford and, uh, and Nixon. Uh, and, and as far as the rest of the people, they didn't believe I could win. Nobody believed I could win. You know, this is just Phyllis's plaything. She can't possibly win. Yet today, that cultural conservative movement that you founded is the base of the Republican Party as yeah, we know it. That's right. At and, least it's a, and, it's and a, a it is an essential base. They they have other other bases too, but it, it's an essential part. A president can't win without it. And and it's interesting that a lot of the national review types and the human events types are actually taking credit for the fusion that was that they created with the cultural conservative movement of which you started yeah yeah well that's okay <laughs> i don't care next question cadet faust um, Mitchell, I think, um, you talked a lot about feminism and uh, single mothers and childbirth and just oh, along those range of topics and I was just wondering about, you know, there's equality and then there's true equality. You can have equality under the law, but for instance, for one, a woman can't make up her husband stay, can't make men stay in her life. And also, just in the business field, when a woman is working and she gives birth, that she's missing at least six weeks of work. And that's six weeks without getting paid. That's six weeks where a man in the same position is working and working towards promotion that she's missing. I mean, should there not be any kind of compensation for that? Or, I mean, if there's no husband in her life, she has no income for six weeks after working, is kind of the situation that right now. If you take away any kind of government help, what are they to do? Well, I don't think it's your employer's job to uh, pay for your pregnancy. I certainly don't. Well, got to come from somewhere. And, uh, well, I have, life's full of choices. You make choices, and um, uh, there was a 
a court case just uh, t just last year, and they had some female judge, and basically she said uh, the the company was um, entitled to uh, recognize if uh, some women are not putting in the full 24/7 that we're expecting, they're not going to get paid the same. And uh, uh, I, I don't think it's your employer's job to to uh, make allowances for that or, or to pay for it. Next question, Cadet Towns. Religious and uh, moral considerations are important. Obviously, they're important to a lot of voters. Like, said, we can't win the presidential uh, can a candidate can't win without them. But uh, just how far is it? The government's job to regulate these social and religious concerns, or to, uh, to make so, laws. such as what? Well, just uh, like marriage or um, abortion. Like, just how far should the government go in regulating that? Well, I think it's the government's job to decide that marriage is a union of a man and a woman, and that's what the law says. And uh, 31 states have passed uh, constitutional amendments that that uh, put that into their law, and we have the federal law. I think it is um, uh, proper for the uh, government to say you can't kill babies. I think it's a matter of killing the baby. It's either the government's place and not the community or the church to enforce these uh, no, views on murder, marriage? No, no, murder, murder is a, a crime, criminal offense that the government should punish. Scientists can dispute that these are not yet human beings, as they're not even born. So, where, where do you draw the line? You, on that? you cannot dispute that the unborn baby isn't a baby. That's that's why the feminists are so unhappy about the ultrasound. You know, we live in an age of pictures, and you see the baby in the ultrasound, you know it's alive. Well, there's a fetus, but it's not not a baby yet, per se. Well, it's it's going to. It's going to grow into a baby. It's not going to grow into a dog or something else. And of course, the laws of every state uh, uh, made abortion illegal prior to Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court overturned the laws of every state. That's what we call supremacist judges. I'm going to put I'm, I'm going to leave a couple of books with you. I guess they got left in the other room. But one of them is my book on the courts, which is a very easy read uh, about the stream of cases in the various issues of um, uh, religion, um, feminism, uh, immigration, uh, property rights, and so forth. And um, the other one I'll leave is my book, Feminist Fantasies, which is about a hundred of my essays on feminism that you can't find anywhere else because they originally came out of the Phyllis Schlafly report, including the first one that started the whole fight, and that's kind of the only source of it. So I'll leave those books uh, for your library, which may, your library may not have it. And then also the biography of me, Phyllis Schlafly and Grassroots Conservatism. You see, most of the other books that you've studied and read about the conservative movement have been philosophical type books. But uh, this book that was uh, play about me by a history, history professor is uh, about the grassroots part of it. And there wouldn't have been a movement without the grassroots part of it. You won the grassroots war against the ERA. Yeah. But hasn't our Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of the United States, for all intents and purposes, actually passed DRA, I mean, they obviously didn't pass it, but they've actually done the equivalent of passing ERA with a number of decisions. Um, they've done a lot, but I don't think the answer to your question is yes. I think the answer to your question is no, uh, because uh, the ERA could have done so many other bad things. But um, uh, they, they have done a, a, a lot of things. But um, uh, we, we already had equal pay laws, and uh, they've got a whole government bureau, Equal Employment Opportunity Act, uh, trying to enforce um, uh, equal 
treatment of women in the workforce. So I don't know what more you could want. Congress did that. And uh, um, the Supreme Court hasn't gotten into the divorce question, I don't think. We have, a, we have a couple other questions. Uh, did you have your hand up, Mr. Mellon? I did. Uh, I Mellon? just wanted to have a question about um, gender roles and gender roles when it came to the family. And do you see those as more going away with more men that are staying home and helping around the family and women going out and being breadwinners? And what are the consequences of uh, that going forward? Well, it's a very limited number. Um, generally, I say, uh, I mean, the, the girls will ask, uh, wh why can't she be the breadwinner and have the man stay home and take care of the baby? And I always say, you, <laughs> you, you, you don't have to get my permission. You just got to find some guy who wants to go along with your ideas. <laughs> and my observation is that most of them don't like that. Most of them, uh, I, I think it's a better plan to have the husband as the uh, provider and protector. And I think men ought to protect women. And, um, but you need to understand that the feminist movement, dating from Betty Friedan's book in 1963, wanted to get all wives out of the home and into the workforce. That was, they wanted to destroy the role of a full-time homemaker. That's very open and shut. That's exactly what they wanted to do. And you ask yourself, why did they want to do that? If they wanted to go into the workforce, um, why wouldn't they be glad a lot of other women are staying home? But that's not the way they look at it. What the, this is the way they look at it. They go in the workforce, and they're in competition for some um, pretty high placed job, uh, uh, law partner or executive or CEO or something, and they're in competition with a man. But he has got an asset that she doesn't have. He has a full time homemaker, which is a wonderful asset to a man. He's, she, she's probably got dinner ready for him when he gets home at night. She's taking, having his children and taking care of the children. And, and the woman in the workforce is insanely jealous of that. And she wants to abolish, she can't have a wife of her own, so she wants to abolish the wife of the man, because that is such an asset to a man. And uh, that's why they hate the full-time helper. And you know, you know, Washington University gave me their highest honor, an honorary degree, a couple of years ago, and the feminists had protests and carried on. They tried to get it stopped. And you ask, what was the real reason they hated me? Was it that I beat ERA? Not really. It was, it, it was because I stood up for the role of the full-time homemaker. And they see her as a terrible threat to the woman in the workforce because it's giving an asset to the man. And I would just suggest to you guys, you've got to find out if your girlfriend is a feminist and you, before you go too far with it. That's right. Uh, and you, um, well, um, so, some of them are pretty, so you, they don't all look like, <laughs> they don't all look like Bella Abso. So the way to really find out is to ask her how she feels about Phyllis Schlafly. And then you'll know whether she's a feminist or not. You, you talked at length about the contempt, about the partnership that you created with the various denominations. Uh -huh. And then that partnership grew into a partnership with the libertarians, as well as with some of the, what we call neoconservatives today. How, do you, how has that partnership changed? And how does, it, how does today's partnership compare to the one that you talked about that occurred during the, during the election of Ronald Reagan? Well, the election of Ronald Reagan, there, there were clearly three identifiable groups. There were the, 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 the leftover people who voted for Barry Goldwater, which is not enough to elect a president. And then were all, all the people in the anti-communist movement, uh, many of whom have been brought in by Fred Swartz and by people who attended study groups about communism and who believed in national defense, believed in military superiority. 
And then you had the people who uh, were against ERA and against abortion and who cared about these social issues that we had brought into the movement. So there are three different kinds of people. And uh, they, they all saw in Ronald Reagan the solution to what they wanted. And it's not a case of their agreeing with each other. It's a, it's a case of agreeing that Ronald Reagan is the guy who can give us what we want. But how is that partnership today? Is it stronger, weaker, more diverse? Uh, how do you see it today? How is it different, if at all? Well, the, the uh, so-called establishment Republicans are very nervous when religious people are around. They're just, they, they just don't know what to make it. They don't understand it. And that's why you have some of them saying, oh, we've got to put social issues on the back burner, or, or we've got to put them aside and not talk about them. It's a great mistake not to talk about them because it does bring people. If you look at the polls, uh, pro-life is, is not at the top of most people's list that they care about. But if you look at the people who are in favor of pro-life, uh, who care about that, put it this way, the people who care about that issue, the big majority are pro-life. So it is a good issue to talk about. And most of the Republicans who were elected in 2010 are pro-life, including all the women. Um, I think you had, you had your hand up, Cadet. Uh, Mr. Lacey? You stole my question, sir. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. McGurk. Uh, Cadet McGurk. Yes, ma'am, ma'am. Um, earlier in this course, we learned that faith is a crucial component in politics. Um, while many religious groups support and make up the pro-family movement and uh, are heavily focused on the moral values of a candidate, would an atheist candidate with equal morals have the same opportunity to be a candidate for the pro-family movement? He has every opportunity to file and be a, ca a candidate. But I can think of when uh, <clears throat> this character in California who's trying to get under God out of the Pledge of Allegiance, what's his name? New Dow. New Dow. He's carried on this case. He wants to get under God, one nation under God, out of the Pledge of Allegiance. And when he was arguing, I think it was the one before the Supreme Court, uh, uh, this question came up that you asked about uh, uh, an atheist. And, and he just said, well, there aren't any atheists elected. And that's about the truth. He'll have a hard time getting elected. So the conservative movement today could not support an atheist? Well, I didn't say that. But I think an atheist would have a hard time getting elected if he proclaims that. So uh, the Ayn Rand objectivist could not get elected today? Or he would have a very hard time? Very hard time. That's right. I think so. And, and would not get that movement in, in, um, at all in back of him, even though strong morals, free markets, the, coming out of the strong libertarian side, um, the cultural conservatives would probably defect. Well, uh, the libertarians and the Ayn Rand people have uh, notions that are, I think, not compatible with real conservatism. So but one of the things that I've learned over the years is that the great lie of American electoral politics is that most elections are affected by this group in the middle. They're not. They're affected by committed people going to the polls because they're committed. If you lose those committed people, you lose elections. It's not that small group in the middle that, that brings you over the top. It's the committed people going out in high numbers. Got time for one more question. Um, yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. Lacey. You've mentioned the, the victories that uh, the cultural conservatives have had at the polls and stuff, but there's also um, the aspect of political socialization in our culture. I mean, the family does it, the church does it, uh, the media does it, the schools does it. Do you think that even though cultural conservatives have been successful at the ballot box, that they're losing the battle when it comes to political socialization? Do you think that, like Professor Factor mentioned at the beginning, Oh, everyone's a feminist these days. Do you feel like 
the, <laughs> the opposite movement is winning when it comes to political socialization. When it comes to political socialization? Right. Well, um, I, I, I'm worried about the general state of the culture, yes. We've lost a lot of that. We've lost a lot of people in that. Um, um, marriage is, well, you look at the figures on how marriage has declined and the kind of people who think it's okay to do without marriage, I think that is extremely unfortunate. I can tell you, I think a happy marriage is the best thing you can hope for to, for a happy life. It's wonderful. And uh, to uh, tell young people that it really doesn't matter whether you get married or not, I think is um, a terrible thing. But you look at the figures, we had a 41% illegitimacy rate in this country last year. And of course, the feminists have, have promoted the idea that kids don't need fathers. And uh, the family courts have almost adopted that too. And it's, um, um, fathers brings, are, I think, are necessary. And uh, I, I do worry about the uh, deterioration of morals in the whole culture. I don't think it's making people happier and, or making a better country. And it's, um, well, the feminists completely control the Obama administration and pretty well dominate the media. You just have to watch that. And they have so many bad ideas. I see Cadet Slater's hand waving there. He asked, he said, one more question. Okay. So we've got to take one more question be okay. before we wrap up. Cadet Slater. Thank you. Uh, it's kind of going back to Mr. McGurk's question. It, it seems to me that if you had someone who had the same moral tradition, the same you know, values, the same emphasis on marriage, the same devotion to a higher cause, even if they were, say, agnostic or atheist, would that would they not? The main difference still being that they don't have the same religious tradition, but they have the moral tradition. Would they not be able to be uh, a part of that? Your, the uh, the conservative movement, the you know, the pro-family movement, would they not have a chance of being elected? Well, a conservative movement is not an exclusive club that you have to sign in and take a, wear a special hat or something like this. That it isn't, it isn't that way. You can vote for anybody you want to vote for. And you convince the voters that you're a good guy, a, a likable guy, why you can go ahead and get elected. I'm, I'm sure there, there probably are some atheists in Congress. There are even a couple of Muslims, aren't there? I think so. So uh, uh, I let the voters decide. But Again, you don't. But you don't think that's an easy one to, to get support from. No, no, from. I don't think it's easy. No, no, I don't. And you ask them, uh, are you going to say the Pledge of Allegiance, and we all stand to pledge allegiance? You going to say under God? The there there is a specific organized anti-religious, anti-Christian movement in this country. And we need to defend ourselves against it. And it's led by the ACLU and uh, Americans United for Separation of Church and State. And uh, they've co-opted a lot of judges. They shop around to find a judge who will uh, decide in their favor. And they also look upon it as a fundraiser, because they win the case, then they're able to collect their uh, lawyer's fees on it. So I am, it's, it's, a big, it's a big issue. And for those of you who are interested in the court decisions, my, I'll, as I say, I'll leave my book for your library, and I think you'd find it interesting. I can't let you leave without asking you one final question, and that is, what is the future of cultural conservatism, religious conservatism, and the GOP from your point of view. Where do you see cultural conservatism, religious conservatism going, and how's the GOP in terms of being part of that? Well, it's part of the GOP, and they're not going to kick them out of the GOP. 
And it's it's a major part of the GOP, no question about it. And and is the is cultural conservatism getting stronger in America? Uh, well, politically, it's uh, doing pretty well. Um, <laughs> on the college campuses, I don't know how it's doing. <laughs> but but across the nation, growing. Well, you, you look at the, the, the growth in illegitimacy. I just think it's a national disaster. We had 41% of the babies born in this country last year born without a, without a father. I, I, just, I just think that is a disaster. As uh, um, one of these um, writers on social things whose name escapes me at the moment, said illegitimacy is really the biggest problem. In fact, it is the only problem because it, it causes so much uh, government spending. It causes so many other problems. Um, most of the social ills come out of mother-headed households. You, you go through it. Uh, uh, pr uh, teenage sex or drugs or crime or so forth. They all come out of mother-headed households. Not all, most of it. And uh, it's just a disaster. And uh, you all need to find a girl who uh, shares your views and find that out before you get married. And she'll help you decide on that girl too. <laughs> Mrs. Phyllis Schlafly, thank you so much for being with us today. It has truly been an honor and a pleasure and very enlightening. Thank you. For, thank you. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.